Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. So I've had a lot of requests for another one of these videos where I read some spooky stories. So I've got another stack of spooky books here from my collection and I'm going to read some. Some of these stories are quite long, some of them are short, and um, if you like the sound of any of these books, I will put in the description the uh, the titles and the ISBN numbers of the books, so you can find them. You don't need to fall asleep to these videos, you can just enjoy them in any way you like. But uh, if you are going to sleep, then get comfortable, relax, and uh, yeah, here we go. So this one's from a book titled World's Greatest Ghosts by Nigel Blundell and Roger Bohr. The story's called Children from Beyond the Grave. When the noise becomes too loud in Edna Ruglas's home, she shouts, Children, please play more quietly. It always works. The two little girls who kick up such a din obey her. Mrs. Ruglis has a fine understanding with these two children, which is unusual because the youngsters have been dead for many years. The children love to run around upstairs in this 300-year-old farmhouse in Devon in West England. Sometimes there's a creaking noise, as if someone was riding an old-fashioned rocking horse, but Mrs. Ruglis says, There's nothing frightening or creepy about them. I'm very fond of children, having had four of my own. Their noise doesn't usually bother me, but one afternoon I heard them run out of the bedroom and start jumping around on the landing. I went into the hall and shouted up to them to stop, and they did. Of course, in their day, children were taught to be obedient. Mrs. Ruglis and her husband Bill, a retired engineer, discovered the ghosts when they moved into the village of Farway. The noises from the bedroom began immediately. Their pet cats and dog refused to go anywhere near the room. Then a friend with an interest in psychic happenings visited the couple on holiday. Mrs. Ruglis said, I deliberately didn't mention the noises of the children to her, but merely asked if she could feel anything unusual in the atmosphere. She told me that the spirits of two girls, aged around four or five, were active in the house and that their names began with E and A. The psychic visitor said she thought the girls were friends rather than sisters. One wore fine clothes and the other not so good clothes. Mrs. Ruglis called in to the local vicar, the Reverend Frederick Gilbert, and checked the parish records and found that two four-year-old girls belonging to the same family died in the house. One was Elizabeth, who was buried in 1844. The other was Anne, whose death was in 1902. Mrs. Gilbert said, It's quite possible that these children were so happy in this house that they were reluctant to leave. Because of the 58-year gap between their deaths, it may seem odd that they should be playmates, but we have our own limited concept of time, and it may mean nothing to them. Mr. Ruglis said, I was most disturbed at first, but my attitude now is that we're lucky to have such pleasant little spirits about the place. Okay, that was a nice light story to start things off with. Ended a bit abruptly, actually. So um, the next one is from the book Ghosts, edited by Morven Eldritch. Little Dean Tower stands close to the village of Maxton in Roxburghshire. The building dates from the 15th century. It has long been uninhabited, but it was at one time the stronghold of the Kerr family. One laird of Little Dean, who lived in the tower in the 17th century, had a particularly bad reputation. The laird was, by all accounts, a thoroughly unsavoury character. He drank heavily, mistreated his family and servants, and took great pleasure in playing an active part in the persecution of covenanters in the district. He had a violent temper, and it's said that on one occasion he became so angry with a stable lad who had saddled and harnessed his horse improperly that he trampled the poor lad to death. The laird enjoyed entertaining his friends. 
The only people who could bear his company were those who shared his liking for excess and bad behaviour, and they spent many raucous evenings drinking themselves incapable. The laird's wife, Margaret, lived a miserable life. Her husband was undeniably cruel in his treatment of her. It seems, however, that she bore it all, for the most part, with remarkable dignity and stoicism. One evening, however, the laird overstepped his mark. He had, as usual, been drinking heavily with his companions, and one of them asked where Margaret was. It was her habit to keep well out of the way of her husband and his cronies at such times. The laird dragged Margaret from her room and down into the dining hall where his visitors sat. He then proceeded to berate her and humiliate her in front of them. Margaret stood, confined by her husband's vicious grip on her arm, and suffered this treatment in silence. At length the laird let her go, uttering a final insult that he would rather be married to a woman from hell, for such a wife would have more warmth than the woman he had married. It was a terrible thing to say, and Margaret finally broke her silence in response to it. You will live to regret these words, she said, before quietly leaving the room. The laird's friends bade him good night and left little Dean, but the laird was too fired up with drink and bad temper to settle. He saddled up his horse and rode into the darkness. After some time he came to a cottage in a clearing in the woods. The door was open and the laird could see a woman inside, sitting at a spinning wheel. He dismounted and approached. His horse seemed strangely agitated as the laird got to the cottage door, and he had to hold its reins very firmly to prevent it from bolting. Looking into the cottage, the laird thought he could see shadowy figures moving in the corners, but it was too dark to make out what they were. He tried to speak to the woman. She didn't respond in words to his greeting. Instead, she stopped spinning and turned to face him, still holding the newly spun thread between her fingers. With a maniacal laugh, she snapped the thread in two. The laird saw no more, for at this point his horse took such fright and pulled away from him with such force that he almost had to let go of the reins. He regained control of the animal at last, mounted and rode away. When he eventually arrived back at Little Dean, he still had the picture of the woman in his mind. She had been the most beautiful creature he had ever laid eyes on. The next day he found that, in spite of himself, he was preoccupied with the woman in the cottage. He set off to try and find her. He rode for most of the day, trying to find the same path through the wood that he had taken the night before, but in spite of many hours searching, he was unable to find any sign of the cottage where he had last seen the woman. He returned to Little Dean frustrated. As he approached his home, however, he caught sight of a graceful figure standing in a glade by the river. It was the very woman for whom he'd been searching. She held out her arms to him in silence, and he went to her eagerly. The laird's obsession with this woman grew. Every night at the same time, just before dark, she would appear at the same place by the river. His desire for her was so great that the laird ignored any need for caution. There, within sight of his marital home, he indulged his passion for this strange woman night after night. It was inevitable that the affair would not remain secret. The laird was seen with the woman, and Lady Margaret was told about it. She confronted him and threw her wedding ring in his face. The laird merely turned on his heel and walked away. Lady Margaret was ready to leave, but before she did, she wanted to find out who her husband's mysterious lover was. Two men volunteered to go and search for the woman on her behalf. And that evening they went to the glade by the river where the laird and the woman had been meeting, and after some time they caught sight of her. As they moved towards her, stealthily, hoping to entrap her, she disappeared. A hare sped away from the place where she had been seen, and ran far off into the distance. 
the two men returned to Lady Margaret to find her in a state of great consternation. The laird was missing. There was little point in mounting a search at this late an hour, for it was too dark. They had no choice but to wait. It was far into the night when the laird's horse finally galloped up to the tower, carrying its master. The horse was sweating and exhausted. The laird was grim-faced and as white as a sheet. He was shaking as he told all those present what had happened to him. He had been riding his horse towards home when he caught sight of a hare running alongside his horse. Before long the hare had been joined by several others, racing along beside him, in front of him and behind him. They leapt around the feet of the horse and jumped up to saddle height. The laird had been very frightened and had tried first to spur his horse on to outrun them, then to cut them down with his sword and trample them with the horse's hooves. His efforts were in vain until he struck the paw of one hair, cutting it clean off. The paw had jumped in the air and landed in his pistol holster. The pack of hairs had then suddenly withdrawn. By the time this had all happened, the laird had ridden all the way to the village of Midlam, a place notorious for witchcraft and many miles from his home. He had spurred his horse into a gallop and had neither stopped nor even slowed his pace until he reached the safety of Little Dean. Devils, he muttered, chattering through his teeth, devils. When he told his tale, the laird put his hand into the pistol holster to feel for the hare's paw. He screamed, quickly withdrawing his hand from the holster and throwing something down on the ground. It grabbed me, he cried. Lady Margaret looked down at the thing that her husband had thrown from his holster. It was not a hare's paw, but the bloody, severed hand of a woman. The laird drew his sword and speared the hand. As he did so, it flexed, very much as if it were alive. The laird took it, still impaled on his sword, out of the tower and made for the river. When he reached the water's edge, he hurled the bloody hand into the river's murky depths with all his might. He was very close to the spot where he and the mysterious woman had been meeting, and when he had thrown the hand into the river, he turned round and saw her, crouching beneath a tree. She lifted her head to look at him. To his horror, the laird saw that her face had been transformed into a hideous, wizened countenance with an evil leer. "'You took my hand from me,' she rasped. "'Now it will be with you forever.' The laird returned to the tower, still shaking. He collapsed into a chair by the fireside and put his hand into his pocket. The hand was there again. He threw it from the window in disgust and stumbled up to his bedchamber, hoping to find relief in sleep. But when he got into bed, he realised he could feel something beneath his pillow. Putting his hand under the pillow, he withdrew the hideous hand. By this time, hysterical with fear, he threw the hand into the fire and hid himself beneath the covers. The laird didn't appear downstairs the next morning. After some time, Lady Margaret sent the servants up to wake him. Not a sound came from the laird's bedroom in spite of the servants' repeated knocking and calling. His door was locked and they had to break it down to gain entry. When they finally managed to enter the room, they found the laird lying on the floor. He was dead. His face, far from appearing peaceful, had a look of unimaginable terror. His neck was bruised, and the bruises appeared to be the marks of fingers around the laird's neck. He had been strangled by the hideous hand. Okay, that one was a bit spooky, wasn't it? <laughs> So this one comes from a book titled The Hangman, the Hound and Other Hauntings by Thomas Coram Caldus. And just a warning, I'm probably going to mispronounce some of these Welsh names, so if you're familiar with these places, please forgive me. This story is titled The Ghost of Green Meadow Mansion. There was once a majestic mansion that stood in Tongwinless near Cardiff. This is the history of Green Meadow Mansion, and the history of what happened to it when it had disappeared from the surface of the planet. 
Does it sound like a paradox? Something is gone, but yet it continues to add to its history? Know you not that there are things more powerful than time, things that are stronger than the impermanence of life? In 1974, local newspapers reported that a council house on a site formerly occupied by Green Meadow Mansion was haunted. Although there is almost nothing left of the original mansion, the ghosts may well have their origin in Green Meadow. In one of the houses on the council estate, Mrs Davies and her children experienced a haunting in 1974. She repeatedly saw the spectre of an elderly woman in one of the upstairs bedrooms. One incident was particularly frightening. The ghost manifested on the landing and called for Mrs Davies' daughter, June. The Davies family was also troubled by loud banging noises, and ghostly footsteps and taps which were turned on by some invisible force. The phantom footsteps are especially of interest. Decades earlier, a witness, Martha Mogridge, complained about a footstep haunting at Green Meadow. This lends some support to the theory that the haunting in the modern building has its origin in Green Meadow. The newspaper, The Cardiff Leader, finally investigated the haunting in the council house. A reporter, Bill Cork, and a photographer, Keith Baker, spent a night in a bedroom of the haunted part of the house. They too had an encounter with the ghost. Around two o'clock in the morning, an eerie haze began to fill the bedroom. They also noted a drop in temperature. Green Meadow dates back to the 17th century when it was owned by the Lewis family. The mansion was troubled by ghosts even at a comparatively early stage of its history. In 1860, the Mellon Griffith Band played an annual supper organised by Henry Lewis. At the end of the event, the band left. When the musicians were walking along the driveway of Green Meadow, a ghost appeared out of nowhere. The musicians were so frightened by the apparition that they dropped their instruments and ran away. They retrieved the instruments in broad daylight as they were too scared to return to Green Meadow by night. It's not quite clear what the musicians had seen. They only said that the ghost was fierce, foul and awful. There was once a gardener at Green Meadow, Daniel, who refused to let the children of the house play in a certain part of the garden. Gwen Wyndham Lewis, the daughter of Henry Lewis, explained that Daniel used to chase her and her friends out of the haunted part of the garden, saying to them, Indeed to goodness, keep away, will you? Daniel himself only reluctantly worked in that part of the garden. It's always remained a mystery why the gardener was so scared of that section of the garden. One morning he was found dead in the mysterious part of the garden. His facial features were distorted with fear. The official version of his death stated that he had died of heart failure. In view of the fact that some of Green Meadow's dogs were found dead next to him, it may be allowed to voice serious concerns as to the correctness of this cause of death. The Oak Room, a former Green Meadow, was the most haunted room of the mansion. Two ghosts used to appear in this room. One was a red-haired man who appeared near a window, leaning on his sword. He would suddenly kneel down as if to say a prayer. He always vanished soon after that. In 1886, Captain Mostyn, a soldier who fought at Rourke's Drift, had an encounter with this ghost. He slept in the oak room and was awoken around dawn by three heavy knocks on the door. He looked up and saw a tall, red-haired man leaning on a sword by the window, looking out into the garden. Suddenly the ghost dropped his sword and fell on his knees. Then he began to pray. The ghost disappeared as abruptly as he had appeared. The captain mentioned the incident to Henry Lewis and was told that the ghost of the red-haired man had been seen frequently. Articles dealing with the haunting of Green Meadow usually mention the captain's encounter with the red-haired ghost as his main experience. However, 
a close look at the letter written by Miss Mugridge, who was another witness of the haunting, reveals that Captain Mostyn also saw a small old man in old-fashioned clothes who was tapping on the walls of the oak room. Gwen Windermere Lewis names a number of witnesses who had experienced the haunting of the oak room. She mentioned Miss Mogridge of Rubina, a doctor whose name she did not give, and Mary Ann Langley of Greenhill, Cardiff. Gwen even informed the public about the haunting of Green Meadow. She wrote to the Cardiff Suburban News and presented a letter which had been written by Miss Martha Mogridge. The letter was originally addressed to Gwen's father, Henry Lewis. In this letter she gives Henry Lewis a detailed account of her experience with the ghost in the Oak Room. In 1878, Miss Mogridge and her sister Mabel stayed in Green Meadow for some time and were given the Oak Room. One night at exactly three o'clock, they had an encounter with a ghost clad in a green coat with silver buttons, white knee breeches, lace at the wrists and a silver rapier on a red sash. The sisters described the ghostly man as small and oldish, with a large nose and an abundance of white hair. The man in green simply flung open the door of the oak room, looked in and entered. It appears he was surprised by the unexpected encounter with the two women, for he passed his hand over his eyes in astonishment. This means that he must have noticed the two sisters, yet he did not answer when Mabel addressed him, asking him who he was. In fact, the man in green completely ignored them and made his way to one of the walls. Then he began tapping the wall, a yard from the floor. After a while he threw up his arms in despair and vanished. At this point Miss Mogridge cited Captain Mostyn's experience with the haunting. Here she revealed that the captain had also seen the small old man. Martha's letter also refers to ghostly footsteps in the house. At one stage the footsteps were so frightening that the gamekeeper John Palmer was aroused and sent to investigate the cause of the footsteps, loaded gun in hand. In connection with Green Meadow, the tragic fate of Katie Koch must be mentioned. It may well have influenced the haunting of Green Meadow. Around 1840, Katie, a young girl of Romany origin, was in love with a man who was nicknamed Magpie because of his style of dress. He always wore a black jacket and breeches and a white waistcoat. Magpie was a tinker by trade and, unfortunately, not an honest man. He talked Katie into stealing silver from Green Meadow, which he sold on to a dealer. Katie was immediately suspected of the crime, and she was well aware of it. She thought it best to make a full confession, hoping all the time that the Lewis family would be forgiving. Far from that, the family insisted on punishment. Accordingly, Katie was sentenced to death by hanging. This was the punishment for theft in those days. She was eventually executed on Heath Common. Before the execution, Katie complained of the injustice of the sentence and cursed Green Meadow, condemning it to disappearance within a hundred years. Her curse came true. Green Meadow is no more. It remains to be investigated to what degree Katie's unhappy life has influenced the hauntings of Green Meadow. Who or what lurked in the dark, candle-lit cellar of Green Meadow? It is said that an unpleasant hunchback dwelled in the cellars of the mansion. Did he sometimes leave the cellars to haunt the driveway and the garden? The unpleasant hunchback would fit the description the ghost that the band encountered on the driveway. Fierce, foul and awful. Was it also the fearsome hunchback that so frightened the gardener Daniel and eventually most likely killed him? Well... There was a smorgasbord of ghosts in that mansion. So this one comes from the book, The Weekend Book of Ghosts and Horror. And it doesn't appear to have an author, so let's have a look. This one's called The Awful Riddle of the Restless Coffins by Peter Rogers. 
It should have been a solemn and dignified occasion, with a handful of mourners joining the bereaved family in grieving over the loss of a beloved child. Instead, the mystery of the moving coffins was to be among the strangest of events in the history of the island of Barbados, and to this day, what went on in that West Indian churchyard in the early part of the last century has never been properly explained. The sight that confronted the mourners when the family vault was opened turned the funeral of little Dorcas Chase into confusion and chaos. Relatives cried out in horror, women swooned, some even fled the scene, convinced that evil spirits were at work. The more stable among them could only gasp in astonishment, for the two lead coffins which had been placed in the vault some years earlier had been moved from their original positions. One of them, containing the remains of another child member of the family, seemed to have been thrown across the vault to an opposite corner, and was now standing almost upright. The Chase family vault had been partly hewn from the limestone rock that is a natural phenomena of Barbados. It was located at Christchurch, near the sea, on the southwest coast of the island. The vault had originally belonged to another family named Elliot. It was empty until 1807 when a Miss Thomasina Goddard was buried there in a lead coffin. The following year, Maria Chase, infant daughter of Thomas Chase, was buried in the vault, also in a lead coffin. Then on July 6, 1812, came the funeral of Little Dorcas and the amazing sight that greeted the mourners. The disturbed coffins were replaced in their original positions, and the coffin of the latest dead child was added. The mystery wasn't solved, and little more was thought of the matter until another infant, Samuel Ames, was buried there in September 1816. When the vault was opened for Samuel's coffin, it was found once again that the coffins, all three of them this time, lay in disorder, having apparently been thrown around the vault. By now the moving coffins were being discussed by every family in Barbados. Sensation seekers came from near and far for a glimpse of the tomb. The superstitious natives refused to work in the fields around the churchyard for fear that the evil they were sure was at work there would somehow find a way of touching them too. The employers had to tempt them with promises of rum, and when that failed, adopted threatening behaviour before the terrified workers would agree to return to their tasks. Next time the tomb was opened was for the burial of another relative, Samuel Brewster, on November 17th, 1816. And again the coffins were found to be in total disarray, lying in random fashion all over the vault. Once more they were restored to their proper positions, and the latest one joined them in the vault. The coffin containing the remains of Mrs. Goddard, the first one to be placed there, was by now in very poor condition, having been damaged so often by the strange happenings in the vault. It was tied up somewhat crudely and put back in its place. The vault was closed and cemented by stonemasons in an attempt to prevent the repetition of the unusual happenings at Christchurch. Another three years passed and another relative died, and when Thomasina Clark's coffin was ready to join the others, the vault was opened. And yet again, disorder reigned. It seemed that no matter how the coffins were left after a burial, they were bound to be in disarray by the time the tomb was next opened. The Barbados coffins were by this time attracting interest far beyond the shores of the island. The less hysterical inhabitants were still looking for some logical explanation, such as vandalism or even earth tremors. But vandalism of this nature was virtually unknown on the island, and there was nothing to suggest grave robbers since no valuables were present in the vault. Besides, the opening of the vault was always the same. There were never any signs of the entrance being disturbed. As for the possibility of earth tremors, why should they always happen at that spot and nowhere else? 
Some other part of the immediate area would have shown some evidence of even a minor quake. The powers that be decided that time for action had come. Such goings on were not good for the morale of the people, especially the superstitious natives. In July 1819 an inspection was carried out by several officials of government and church. The coffins were left in their proper positions and the mouth of the vault was closed and cemented by masons. It was then closely examined by the officials and the rector of the parish. Each official put his own private mark in the wet cement as a seal. No natural force could enter the vault without disturbing it. Sand had already been placed on the floor inside so that footprints of any intruder would clearly be shown. Less than a year later the tomb was inspected again by order of the Governor of Barbados, Lord Comamere. All the island's leading officials were present. The marks they had made on the cement seal were still intact. The heavy slab of stone was still in its place across the opening. It took four men to lift it. Inside the smooth sand indicated that there had been no intruders. In incredibly but in an awful way predictably the same familiar chaos greeted their eyes. The heavy coffins had been distributed in their usual random fashion around the vault. Yet how could it be? The walls of the vault were solid limestone. The entrance had been sealed by experts and clearly not disturbed, but someone or something had moved those coffins. Not only moved them, but hurled them around the interior of the vault like some fiend taking his revenge on death itself. The experts argued interminably. The earth tremor theory was given short shrift, since the violence had always been confined to within the tomb. Was the whole thing an elaborate joke? It seemed unlikely, since the members of the family were too aware of the distress these manifestations were causing. The natives, on the other hand, were too terrified of graveyards to become involved in any such tasteless prank. Nevertheless, enough was enough. The governor ordered that the coffins should be removed and placed in separate graves in different parts of the churchyard and the vault officially closed. This was done, and from that day, no more disturbances occurred. Today, tourists who visit the island can still see some of these graves, but a fire destroyed most of the church back in the 30s. Visitors can also examine part of the limestone where the opening of the vault was located, and no doubt wonder, as people have done for more than 150 years, just what unexplained force moved those coffins. Okay, that was an interesting case, although that book was written in uh, 1882, so I don't know if any other theories to explain the moving coffins has been put forward since then. So this story comes from the book Ghostly Tyne and Weir by Rob Kirkup. It's the tale of the Marsden Grotto. In 1782, Jack Bates, an unemployed miner from Allendale, moved to Marsden in South Shields, looking for work. Without money to buy a house, he discovered the many caves hidden within Marsden Bay's limestone cliff face and set about expanding one of them with explosives until it was a good size for himself and his wife to live comfortably. This earned Jack the nickname of The Blaster. Jack found it hard to come by work, and it's believed that in order to earn money he may have had illicit dealings with many of the smugglers who came ashore at Marsden Bay. They'd used the caves for centuries to hide their contraband. In 1788 Jack carved out stone steps from the beach to the cliff top. The stairs that are there nowadays still carry the nickname Jack the Blaster Stairs. In 1792 Jack the Blaster died and his widow moved away from the area, leaving their unusual home empty. Peter Allen decided to move into the cave in 1826, expanding it further and making it more accessible. During the excavations 18 human skeletons were uncovered, believed to be the remains of smugglers who had met their end due to their unlawful dealings, and in most instances likely to have been double-crossed by their own kind. 
The improvements took a number of years, but Alan successfully constructed a two-story cave, complete with a basic kitchen, and it opened as an inn named the Tam O'Shanter, renamed shortly after as the Marsden Grotto. The inn proved popular with the smugglers of the day, and the landlord turned a blind eye to their illegal activities, often hiding cargo for them in return for their valued custom. In 1849, Peter Allen passed away and his wife and children continued to run the inn. There were several freak high tides which hit Marsden Bay during the 1850s, resulting in the death of several smugglers on the beach and in its caves. It also flooded the Marsden Grotto, resulting in costly repairs on each occasion. In 1865, a cliff face collapsed, damaging the inn considerably. In 1874, the Allen family left the Marsden Grotto. The business was taken over by Sydney Milne's Hawks and improvements were made to the interior to make the building structurally sound. Marsden Grotto was then sold on to the Vox Brewery in 1898. They installed a lift and ran the business successfully for over a century before selling it on in 1999. Today the Marsden Grotto is still a very popular restaurant and bar. The Marsden Grotto, the only cave bar in Europe, is an amazing place. There are rumours of hidden rooms within the grotto waiting to be discovered. It is also widely regarded as the most haunted public house in England. Banging, whispering and screaming have been heard. Sightings of fully formed apparitions are commonly reported, attributed to the building being steeped in violence, double-crossing and cruelty. In the 1840s, a smuggler willingly sold information to a HM customs officer. Other smugglers got word of this and confronted him one rainy night on the beach in front of Marsden Grotto. The smuggler was only too aware that if they knew the truth they'd kill him. He made a run for it but was quickly caught. He begged for his life but his captors showed no mercy, raining blows down on him and breaking his arms and legs in multiple places. They then put him into a barrel used for transporting their illegal goods, barely large enough for him to fit inside. They nailed the lid down as he became hysterical, pleading with them to stop. They then placed the barrel deep inside one of the caves in a cliff face where he was left to die. His screams of desperation and hunger were heard for several days until he died. It's believed that the barrel was never recovered and the dead smuggler's skeletal remains are still inside that barrel to this day, hidden in one of the many caves at Marsden Bay. On stormy nights, as the rain lashes down and the wild wind blows, his ghost can still be heard screaming out in terror. Several years later, a HM customs officer went to Marsden Grotto and befriended a smuggler who was a regular customer. The smuggler was unaware of his new friend's occupation. The officer showed a keen interest in how the smuggler earned his money and asked lots of questions. The smuggler trusted him and told all. He eventually realised what was going on and a fight broke out between the pair. The smuggler was shot and died in the inn. Peter Allen emptied the smuggler's tankard and nailed it to the wall, proclaiming that if anyone should drink from the tankard they would be cursed, and if the tankard was removed from Marsden Grotto, the ghost of the dead smuggler would return and haunt the building for forevermore. The tankard on display is not the original, it's a replica. The original vanished many years ago. Many believe that the ghost of the murdered smuggler still remains at the grotto to this day, and it's responsible for much of the inexplicable phenomena reported on almost a daily basis. I spoke to Suzanne Hitchingson about an investigation at Marsden Grotto in 2005, the most notable thing to happen was in the cave bar where we were sitting quietly waiting for any spirits to make themselves known. I saw what appeared to be a black silhouette standing near the pool table. 
I was with another investigator and he also confirmed that he could see the black mass. We sat and watched it for about 40 seconds before it disappeared. Marsden Grotto undoubtedly has a truly fascinating bloody past to match any building in the region. However, Marsden Bay could itself claim to have an even more impressive history, and in particular the legend of its very own sea monster, the Shoni. Belief that a sea monster lurks beneath the North Sea at Marsden dates back to the 9th century when the northeast of England was under control of the Vikings. The Shoni is a Viking name, and the Norsemen took the threat of the monster very seriously. In order to pass Marsden Bay safely, they would offer a human sacrifice to the Shoni. Crew members would draw lots, and the loser would have his hands and feet trussed and his throat slit. Then he would be thrown overboard. The Vikings believed that the Shoni would take the sacrifice to his underwater lair and allow the Viking longships to pass. This tradition was carried on by Scandinavian sailors until well into the 12th century. Bodies were washed up all along the coastline as far north as Lindisfarne. Sometimes they were untouched, but occasionally appeared to have been half eaten. The last body washed up at Marsden Bay was in 1928. Despite the Shoni appearing to be a mythical beast feared by many superstitious Vikings almost 1,200 years ago, there have been a large number of reported sightings of an unusual sea creature at Marsden Bay over the years. Mike Halliwell, author of several books including The Mystery Animals of the British Isles, Northumberland and Tyneside, and co-author of the South Shields Poltergeist, One Family's Fight Against an Invisible Intruder, told me of his potential sighting of the Shoni in 1998. He says, I was driving along the coast towards Whitburn with my father and my wife when I looked towards the sea at Marston Bay. About 30 yards from the shore was a huge brown thing breaking the surface of the water. Although only a small hump appeared above the water level, I could see a much larger area just beneath the surface. I thought I must have been seeing things, so I shouted to my wife to look to see if she could see it too. My wife could also see it, although neither of us knew what it could be. We parked at the next opportunity and looked out to the sea again. It was still there. It had completely vanished beneath the water, but through the waves we could still see its brown colour, although the shape was indistinct. After what seemed like no more than a couple of minutes, we lost sight of it. When we arrived home, we saw the front page of that evening's Shields Gazette, which was of a dolphin that had been seen at Marsden Bay and had been nicknamed Daphne the Dolphin. We both thought that we may well have seen Daphne for ourselves, however the creature we saw was far too big to be a dolphin and was also the wrong colour. I then received a phone call from a local councillor on an unrelated matter and I happened to mention Daphne the dolphin that I thought I might have seen her, although I explained that what I'd seen seemed to be much larger than a bottlenose dolphin. Funny you should say that, said the councillor. I was buying some fish and chips in South Shields, and I overheard two men in the queue talking about something they'd seen at Marsden Bay. I overheard one of them say, No way was that a dolphin. What I saw could have swallowed a dolphin in one gulp. Okay, that's Marsden Grotto. Somewhere quite close to where I live, but I've surprisingly never actually visited. Okay, so this comes from the book It Happened to Me, Volume 6. Just a collection of people's real-life spooky experiences. Not all of them are paranormal. This one I'm going to read could have a natural explanation, but it's, it's kind of spooky anyway, so I thought I'd read it. It's called Box of Bones, written by Matt. When I was about six or seven, my parents had taken me and my older sister to a nearby club where they were having a few drinks and meeting up with friends and family. This was usually a weekly occurrence, but it was rare that we visited this particular club. 
there wasn't much for a young child to do. There was a Pac-Man arcade machine in the corner which didn't hold my attention for long, probably due to the fact that I had no money to put in it. And by now feeling the effects of the sugar rush after several glasses of cola, I was becoming very impatient. We decided to go and play outside the club. I remember it being a particularly hot and humid day and there wasn't much shade around. There was a large cricket pitch overlooked by the club, surrounded by a small incline of uncut grass all the way around. To try and alleviate the boredom we decided to race around the cricket pitch, up and around the back of the club and back to where we started. The race was pretty even but it didn't take long for us to get out of breath in the heat and my sister started to take the lead. She headed towards the back of the club. This back area wasn't really accessible there was an extension to the main building that stretched out about a foot away from a tall dry stone wall that separated the grounds from the street beyond. I had trouble navigating the small gap with my tired legs and the long grass and fallen stones. Past the extension the area opened up but it was no easier to cross due to a steep incline into a ditch bordering the back of the building. The whole area was enclosed by the building and the wall and felt very secluded. I was catching up with my sister but I realised she wasn't running. She had stopped to look back at me to see how far behind I was but she was staring past my right side looking white as a ghost. I glanced over my shoulder and saw a large black box about six foot high and two foot across nestled down in a ditch where the main building and extension met. The box itself was seemingly made of wood with peeling black paint. It looked pretty old and battered and at the top of the box, which was pretty close to eye level due to it being in a ditch, was a glass pane, very dirty and dusty with cobwebs built up in the corners inside. It was hard to see through due to the glare from the sun so I tried to peer in. That's when I saw it. There was a skeleton inside the box. I could see its skull and the shoulders. Shocked I jumped back and looked around for my sister who had already started running off in the other direction. Wasting no time I ran after her as fast as I could until we got to the far corner of the building. There was a hornet's nest in the wall but there was nothing going to make us head back the other way so we shot round the corner and back into the club. We tried our best to get some adults to come out and see, but no matter who we spoke to, we were ignored. It was almost as if we weren't even there, or we were told we were just being silly. My sister didn't leave the club for the rest of the day, choosing instead to sit by my parents until they took us home, but I had to confirm what I'd seen. Not being brave enough to go back round by myself, I decided to go outside the grounds and scale the wall to take a peek. It was hard going and quite dangerous being dry stone, but I managed to just get my head over the top. There was nothing there. Less than 30 minutes had passed since we'd first seen the box with the skeleton inside and now there was nothing there at all. Now, I doubt this skeleton was real, as in it being a corpse. Why would it have been back there? And I'm pretty sure skeletons aren't able to stand upright even if they are in a box. It was hardly an easy to reach location either. The only way it could have been physically moved in or out was by going all the way round the building and past the aforementioned hornet's nest. If anyone had decided to move the box it would have taken a number of people and they certainly would have had to walk past the front of the club between the windows where we were sitting and the cricket ground. The thing never moved or gave any indication of being supernatural. The mystery is, what was it doing there, and where did it go? I'm not sure what time of year it was, but going by the weather it was unlikely to have been close to Halloween, and if it was a prop of some kind, it was definitely impressive, something more likely to be used in a movie set than in a local club. Okay, so this one comes from a book titled Hauntings, True Stories of Unquiet Spirits by Paul Rowland. And this is about the Pontefract Poltergeist. 
a large proportion of poltergeist activity may be attributable to surges of psychokinetic energy in rare incidents and possibly to the unconscious creation of thought forms. But there are several well-documented cases that appear to offer compelling proof of the presence of malevolent spirits. In 1966, the Pritchards of Pontefract, Yorkshire, were a typical middle-class British family. Mr Pritchard had a good steady job which allowed his wife Jean to stay home to look after their two children, 14-year-old Diane and 5-year-old Philip, but their safe suburban life was soon to be violently disrupted. It began innocuously enough, with pools of water on the kitchen floor. What puzzled the Pritchards was the fact that there were no splash marks, but as both the children furiously denied having played a prank, there was nothing for them to do but mop up and shrug their shoulders. They weren't aware at the time that the unexplained appearance of water on walls and floors is a characteristic feature of a poltergeist attack, but they were soon to get a crash course on the subject of the paranormal. When more pools of water appeared, the board inspectors were called in, but they could find no trace of a leak. The following days saw more minor phenomena, but before they could be investigated seriously, they ceased and the Pritchards went back to normal. They had two years of normality before the phenomena returned, this time centering on Diane. Loud reports accompanied the smashing of crockery and other ornaments. So loud were these noises that neighbours would gather outside the house and wonder if the normally placid couple were having an all-out domestic spat. Yorkshire people pride themselves on their down-to-earth common-sense attitude to whatever unpleasant surprises life throws at them, but even the tightly knit community to which the Pritchards belong were beginning to talk of poltergeists. The children told their friends that Diane had been dragged out of bed by unseen hands, and the parents confided to neighbours that she had been pinned to the floor on several occasions by falling furniture which took both of them to lift off her. Curiously, despite the damage it caused, all this activity never actually hurt anyone. Even Diane emerged uninjured from the attacks. Only at the end did the spirit turn nasty, dragging Diane up the stairs in full view of her father, mother and brother who, tackling the unseen entity, forced it to loosen its grip on her throat. But in case anyone thought that this was the girl's attempt to get attention, she was able to show them a set of angry red finger marks on her neck. And Diane's mother confirmed her story, adding that she had seen large footprints at the bottom of the stairs that day and that the carpet had been soaking wet. The poltergeist was evidently not content with being a nuisance. And soon after the attack on Diane, it decided to scare the family to death by manifesting in the form of a hooded monk. Mr and Mrs Pritchard described seeing a spectral figure in the night, framed in an open doorway, and several independent witnesses saw a shadowy glimpse of what appeared to be a hooded figure in black elsewhere in the house. On one occasion, a neighbour claimed to have felt a distinctive presence behind her and when she turned around, found herself confronting a tall, hooded monk whose face was hidden by a cowl. An instant later, it disappeared. The final sighting occurred one evening when Mr and Mrs Pritchard saw a tall silhouette darken the frosted glass of the dining room door. When they looked inside the room, they saw a shadowy shape sink slowly into the floor. It was the last incident of the baffling Pontefract case. Subsequent research has unearthed the fact that the Pritchard house had been built on the site of a gallows where a Cluniac monk had been hanged for rape during the reign of Henry VIII. In 1980, the writer Colin Wilson, an expert on the paranormal and avowed skeptic on the subject of spirit, visited the Pritchard family and interviewed other witnesses, including their neighbours. Their testimonies, together with tape recordings of the violent banging noise and contemporary news reports, finally convinced Wilson that this was a genuine case of poltergeist activity by an independent entity. He later wrote, 
The evidence points clearly in that direction, and it would be simple dishonesty not to admit it. Okay, so I'm going to pick something from the book Supernatural England, edited by Betty Puttick. And again, this isn't really about ghosts, but it's kind of spooky and interesting. And it's a little collection of stories called Time Slips. Imagine you pass an acquaintance in the street and give a wave. Your acquaintance acknowledges you. He's going in the opposite direction. You immediately turn the corner and here is your acquaintance coming towards you once more. But this is impossible for you saw him further back and going in the opposite direction only seconds earlier. He could not have arrived where he is now. To do that he would have had to turn back, run past you without you seeing him and then turn around and appear once more walking towards you. Or, like some superhuman athlete, he had raced around several streets and come face to face with you again. Or, he has a double, perhaps. Well, is that possible? That he has a double, though you never knew it at all? And remarkably, the double is only yards ahead of your acquaintance? Unless, of course, it is the double you're now seeing. And isn't it strange that they were both wearing the same clothes? And the second figure, now that he's up to you, also acknowledges your wave. No, this is without doubt your friend. There are several cases of this kind on record, and it is reckoned that some kind of slippage in time has taken place. Imagine time to be something like a piece of string held out taut, and we move across it at the same pace. But say this straight length of string somehow loses its tautness, then it gets a loop in it. What if time sometimes does this? It may be a highly unscientific way of describing time, but perhaps it helps us to understand what might have happened when you twice met your friend in the street. Either he or you somehow walked around in a time loop. Enough of trying to describe time slips. Here's a fascinating illustration from Tunbridge Wells. On the morning of the 18th of June 1968, an elderly lady, Mrs. Charlotte Warburton, went shopping with her husband in the town. They decided to go their separate ways for a while and meet up later. Unable to find a particular brand of coffee from her usual grocer, she went into a supermarket in Claverley Road. As she entered the shop, she saw a small cafe through an entrance in the left-hand wall. She had never before realised that there was a cafe there. It was rather old-fashioned with wood-panelled walls. There were no windows and the room was lit by a number of electric bulbs with frosted shades. There was at the time, she thought, nothing especially odd about the scene. Two women in rather long dresses were sitting at one end of a table and about half a dozen men all in dark lounge suits were sitting at other tables further back in the room, she said. All the people seemed to be drinking coffee and chatting. A normal sight for a country town at 11 o'clock in the morning. Mrs Warburton didn't stay, but she certainly didn't recognise anything amiss, either then or indeed for several days. Even the rather formal and slightly off-key clothing made no immediate impression on her. Nor did the fact that, although the customers were talking, there was no noise from them that caused her to question her senses. Nor did she notice that there was no smell of the coffee. There was clearly something strange here, yet, without questioning the circumstances in which she found herself, Mrs Warburton blithely left the cafe and went to meet her husband, and she didn't suggest to them that the scene in the cafe seemed in any way odd. When they came to Tunbridge Wells on their next shopping expedition, Mrs Warburton decided to take her husband to the cafe, or rather she hoped to take him there. But of course, they never did find the place, though they searched the streets up and down. No, they were told in the supermarket there was no cafe there. She must have been in the wrong building. It was then that they learnt about the Cosmos Cinema, which had stood on the site of the supermarket. It had had a small cafe. 
they were directed to the Tunbridge Wells Constitutional Club where the steward told them that at one time the Constitutional Club had owned the premises adjoining the Cosmos which was now incorporated into the supermarket. The club had had an assembly room in those days and to the rear a small bar with tables for refreshments. Mrs Warburton's description tallied exactly with the club's old refreshment room. The bar, the cinema and the assembly room had all vanished years ago, Mrs Warburton was told. Yet on the 18th of June 1968 she had stepped into the past and, like others involved in time slips, she had accepted without question the place in which she found herself. Retrospective clairvoyance it is called. Whatever it is, it is mighty odd to contemplate. Another time slip incident took place in Kent some years earlier. In 1935, Dr. E.G. Moon, a very down-to-earth Scots physician with a practice in Broadstairs, was at Minster in Thanet visiting a patient, Lord Carson. He lived at Cleve Court. After talking to Carson, the doctor left his patient and made his way downstairs into the hallway. His mind was clearly very occupied at the time with the instructions he had given the nurse about the prescription he had left for Carson. At the front door, Dr. Moon hesitated. He wondered whether to go back upstairs to have another word with the nurse. It was at this point that the doctor noted that his car was no longer where he had left it on the driveway. In fact, it had been parked alongside a thick yew hedge and that too was missing. Even the drive down which he had driven from the main road was now nothing but a muddy track and a man was coming towards him. The newcomer on the scene, only 30 yards from Dr. Moon, was rather oddly dressed, wearing an old-fashioned coat with several capes around the shoulders, and he wore a top hat of the kind seen in the previous century. As he walked, he smacked a switch against his riding boots. Over his shoulder, he carried a long-barreled gun. He stared hard at Moon, and the doctor registered the fact that the man coming towards him might have looked more at home in the 19th century. Remarkably, Dr. Moon seems not at the time to have been either alarmed or even mildly surprised by the change of scenery, by the quite oddly dressed man approaching him, or the fact that his car was missing. What preoccupied him was the thought of Lord Carson's prescription. He simply turned away without concern and went back into the house. But he did quite casually take one more look at the scene before leaving, and now as if by magic, the car was back where it had been, and the yew hedge too. The drive was no longer a muddy track, and the man had also disappeared, back one assumes to the previous century. It was only now that Dr Moon realised that something odd, something decidedly odd, had occurred. All of this took seconds, so there is every reason to understand why Dr. Moon didn't immediately go out into the driveway to see where the missing car was. For the same reason, it's understandable why he didn't speak to the man dressed like a farm bailiff of the past. Dr. Moon was drawn into some kind of accepting, hallucinatory state. When he came to, for that seems to be the best way of describing his return to his own time, he described to Lady Carson what he thought had occurred. He was anxious, however, that no word of it should come out in his lifetime, for fear that his patients would begin to question his judgement. It was only after his death that the story was revealed. It is difficult to grapple with the notion of time slips. It may be that all past events are impressed into the fabric of buildings, and that in some way and on some occasions they are released. In other words, what Mrs Warburton and Dr Moon saw were ghosts, but not solely of people, but of all their surroundings. Or did Mrs Warburton and Dr Moon actually return to a real, physical past? Were they really the interlopers at somebody else's present? And if so, and this is an intriguing yet unanswerable question, did some people drinking coffee one Saturday morning in Tunbridge Wells Cafe look up and see Mrs Warburton? Did a man dressed like a farm bailiff walking towards Cleve Court one day, well over a hundred years earlier, see a strangely dressed doctor at the front door of the house? 
Did the coffee drinkers ever wonder where the elderly lady had suddenly gone? And did the farm bailiff ask himself how the oddly dressed figure in the doorway had so suddenly disappeared? Strangely, Tunbridge Wells has thrown up another odd story that may or may not have been a time slip. This tale goes back to some time in the mid 19th century and it took place in the Swan Hotel in the Pantiles. Mrs Nancy Fuller and her younger daughter Naomi were on a first visit to the town taking a room at the top of the hotel. The room is now number 16. As they climbed the stairs to their room the girl's behaviour began to change. She appeared more and more agitated, closing her eyes and whispering to herself. When the mother asked what was wrong with her Naomi replied that she would recognised the stairway and that she had been there before. Then she came out with the astounding remark that her lover was waiting for her in the room, as he had said he always would. When they entered the room, the young girl went at once to a corner, calling out John, as though to someone standing there. For a few seconds in her mother's eyes, she seemed to change, to grow older, and even her clothing was that of an earlier time. The story that Naomi later told her mother was that she had previously lived in the building when it was a privately owned house. This was certainly before 1835 when it had become the Swan. In the days when Naomi had lived there it had been known as High House. The young girl went on to explain that she had had a love affair with a man called John but her father had disapproved. He had taken the young man away and had locked her in the room. Alone in the room and aware that she would never again see him, she had conjured up the image of John and, holding the hand of her imagined lover, she had jumped to her death from the window. Room 16 is haunted. There are still tales of disarranged bed covers and of chairs being moved and tapping at the window. Some have even claimed to have heard the cry, John carried on the wind. But is this an example of a time slip? It differs from the other accounts in that Naomi was aware of the past life and her part in it. Some have regarded the story as an instance of reincarnation, others have seen it as deja vu, but if reincarnation is the answer, what is it that triggers such an awareness of it? And if deja vu, how can that come about? It's all so complex, perhaps it is simply a haunting resulting from a young girl's suicide. But the story is so curious that the idea of a time slip is tempting. So I think that I'll do for tonight. And I hope if you're not asleep already, you're at least suitably relaxed. And if you are asleep, then hopefully you can hear my voice wishing you a very pleasant night's sleep and sweet dreams. Okay, thanks for listening. Until next time, goodbye.